Dr. John Bruni from Sage International has arrived. I tell you what, Doctor, there are a few things to talk to you about. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> <laughs> so we we um, we got Yaya Sinwa. Yes. Uh, how big a deal was he? Uh, well, look, if you believe in the uh, idea that every group has a leadership and you know, the group is dependent on the good graces of the leader to guide them into the next level of conflict, then you would think that killing someone like Yaya Sinwa will have a beneficial effect on Israel's war against, or no, dare I say, Netanyahu's war against Hamas. Mm. I, on the other hand, think that there might be something different to this because, you know, there has been just so much blood spilt in that area. Um, leadership figures come and go, and as populations radicalize, you'll find that there'll always be a, a second tier, third tier person who's quite happy to step into the breach and quite happy to continue the fight. Now, there have been some people, I was listening to the ABC uh, news piece by John Lyons on the way in, and, you know, he said, oh, well, this is going to be great for Israel because now all of a sudden the Israeli hostages, I think there are about 102 of them left that are still alive, will be released because, you know, Hamas is on the ropes. Well, look, I'm not so sure about that. Hamas is still fighting one year after Israel's quite massive intervention into that little tiny uh, yeah. strip of territory. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm not so sure whether or not people are in the negotiating mood, so to speak, especially since how many, uh, there's 2.3 million Gazans, uh, about 80% of whom have now been displaced. Yeah. Every uh, structure that could be considered a home um, has been leveled in many quarters of that tiny, tiny place. I think now the politics of revenge really comes forward. Yes. And I'm not sure anyone's in a forgiving mood, not on the Palestinian side and certainly not on the Israeli side. Well, Israel being led by Netanyahu. I mean, I, I don't blame Israel per se, but I do blame the governments who are playing these, uh, these, these particular games. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah, look, uh, my, my view on this, John, might be a bit different to yours. Uh, I, I think, for example, now with the uh, age-long uh, conflict in the Middle East between these, these folk, mm. uh, this is Israel's once-in-a-generation opportunity to do something quite serious. And uh, their ability to be surgical mm. with taking out some of these leadership figures has been quite extraordinary in this sort of modern warfare uh, scenario. And this is, this is the guy who's been taken out who used the so-called human shields all the time. So he's not a, he's not a good guy in any stretch of the imagination, but he's, he's used human shields. They've taken him out. And I think Israel, I mean, what, uh, I said this before to you, what, what does Israel do? I mean, they do need, everyone accepts that Israel needs to protect themselves. And then the, the questionable part of the argument is, how much effort do you put into protecting yourself and when do you start and finish a conflict? And my view is this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. I mean, it might bring about a ceasefire eventually in time. It will probably rage again because that's just the nature of the beast over there. They're, they're conflict-orientated, these people. So you think, I, I, well, from what I gather, you know, this whole mowing of the lawn around Israel's periphery seems to be a periodic event. Mm. If that's the case, then there will be no uh, decisive victory for Netanyahu in this struggle. I think that, yes, he may be able to take out the Hezbollah leadership, but let's be blunt about it. Hezbollah is still fighting. Uh, the IDF is having a bit of a you know pushback in terms of the IDF's army units in southern Lebanon, so it's not really a cakewalk over there. Um, and I think that is as damaged as Hezbollah had been by the initial strike, the shock has been absorbed. Other people have stepped into the breach, and I think that we're looking at a long-term problem for Israel up in the northern border. So again, one of the things that we have to understand, yes, you're right. I mean, the, the Middle East is a conflict-prone area. It always has been... And without getting into the controversies, but you can't help but step and break shells when you talk about the Middle East either on one side or the other. If you look at the Arab perspective, you know, Israel is an illegitimate entity. It's part of a European colonial enterprise, or at least a North American-backed European colonial enterprise after World War II. Western guilt allowed Israel to move in in a rather forceful manner, displacing a lot of Palestinians. Uh, in the process, uh, in, in a, an event called the Nakba. 
um, you know, at what point do people just accept Israeli military and cultural superiority in an area where most of the people who live in the area don't believe that they are legitimate? So how do we actually end any sort of war in that frame? I can't see it ending well. And I think, yes, you might be right. I mean, it could be a case of Netanyahu saw an opportunity to go into demonstrate Israeli military superiority once and for all, at least in his mindset, but he's not going to be prime minister forever. There'll be other Israeli prime ministers who will have to then operate as a consequence of, well, okay, Netanyahu's broken all these entities around Israel's periphery. Now it's my turn to actually do something about it. So the war will continue just in a different guise. It won't be Netanyahu at, the, at Israel's helm. It'll be someone else. And it won't be a blessing. It'll be a curse on the Israelis because you know, Israel is a small country and its military forces, while very powerful and their intelligence services are, you know, first rate, no one m puts any question on that. But it's a small country. And how can they use generation of generation of Israelis on a periodic war mobilization footing? I mean, obviously, part of the Israeli society is going to have to suffer. And I would argue that the economy is currently suffering mm -hmm. in Israel. What um, about the casualties? To this point, how many people would you think that uh, each side has lost? Well, look, uh, we don't know for certain, and this is the thing. I mean, the Israelis will say that, uh, you know, anything tainted by the Hamas brand, including the so-called um, health agencies, are uh, exaggerating their claims. You know, so we're looking at what we can see on the op open source at about 40,000 Palestinian casualties. Not all of them, obviously, are Hamas fighters. That's a lot of civilian casualties. Now, yeah. in warfare, there is something called proportionality. No one says that October 7th wasn't something that was god-awful in every capacity. But then Israel, being the militarily superior power, has a responsibility in a sense because it, it, it claims to be a Western nation. It claims to be a democracy you know, like Australia and most of Western Europe. Now, we would like to think that we would never act in such rageful manners that we would, you know, like if someone poked, poked us badly, that we would come after them with a sledgehammer and smash the entire box and dice, mm -hmm. as Netanyahu has currently done with Hamas in mm -hmm. Gaza. So was that a proportional response to October 7? Some people will say, oh, well, you know, who cares about the Palestinians? They're, all, they're, a, they're a group of warring people. They'll never be at peace. Well, yeah, but think about the foundation of Israel. It was not a democratic process. I mean, if we're really blunt about it, there were Jewish militias, some might even say terrorists, who actually intimidated the Palestinian population away from what they had considered their home. And what would you do if you were in a current situation like that? I mean, would you fight for what you believed is mm. right? Or would you just say, oh, well, you know, the Israelis, well, or whoever's mm. conquering me, that's okay, I'll just sit back and relax. But isn't that the history of the world, that uh, might is right, uh, that uh, one person uh, looks at uh, the positions of another? Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, Jeremy, I think that you've actually nailed it. In, in terms of the fact of... Uh, Israel, Palestine and Israel in the Middle East is a microcosm of every human conflict going back into history. And the roots of this conflict go back into history mm -hmm. because both mm -hmm. sides claim that they've got thousands of years of, you yeah. know, existence. Yeah, in including that Australia, way. including Australia. Well, yeah, but sure. if, you, if you can't control your borders and you mm -hmm. can't control uh, or you're, you're outnumbered or you, you, you are up against superior technology, uh, nature takes its course. Well, it does. And and look, you know, we're a conflict-prone species. Um, migration, when it didn't come at the point of a spear or a gun, uh, is now, you know, just a free movement of people in the 21st century. But then there are those nativist populations who are seeing their cultures changing uh -huh. and their will to resist is now seeing an upswing in racism, which, of course, is a way that nativist populations push back, you know, to make it yes. an unwelcoming country rather than a welcoming country. Hence the problems of uh, migration sweeping Europe. Um, yep. You know, Sweden, yep. Germany, yep. Italy. Yep. Uh, and now Australia. And now Australia. Well, because, because this conflict has actually uh, brought to the surface the internal conflicts in Australia. That's because right. Because the people who... And what we have to understand is that 
our, our view of the Middle East is a Western view of the Middle East. And yep. if you were, if we were living and born in the in the Middle East, mm. we would consider, as John says, a quite a different scenario. Oh, gotcha. Yes, quite yes. a different scenario. Yep. And uh, the colonization and the the effects of a war and the people who win so-called win the war and they mm. carve up territory like they carved up Europe and carved up other parts of the world. Mm. But it goes beyond that. I mean, if you go to a biblical sense and mm. you look at the land of the Middle East, the land of Cana and the Israelites, yep. it, there's massive foundations to all that. And, so and how funny, far do we actually throw that back? Well, exactly. And there's even, I mean, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I know enough about that sort of side of things to suggest that when you pick up a Bible or you go into the old scrolls of religious doctrine, it was filled with warfare even back then. The 12 mm. tribes of Israel were united by force. They weren't reunited because they were uh, an inherently democratic group of people who came together and said, we're all Jews, let's enjoy a, a, a Sabbath together. They were happily killing each other for quite some time. And this is, this is now the 21st century version of what was always the case in that part of the world, you know? So, well, what, what you got is human nature, right? Yeah. Well, somebody once explained to me, what is human nature? It is equal proportions of jealousy, mm. vanity, lust, and greed. And that's what people are made up of. Yeah. And, uh, and timing-wise, in, in the, the Gazan area, the population is very, very young. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think 90% is what? Under the under, age of- 20. 20 or so. Mm. And so these people are, are very vulnerable to being influenced by others. Mm. As, our, as our young here in Australia, the woke, woke culture that's permeating Australian culture amongst the young is quite frightening compared to our generations, what we learnt and our values and yeah. ideals. But Hamas, as a territorial government in, in Gaza, has infiltrated the minds of the young. These people, and I agree with you, John, these people aren't going to rapidly change their mind about what's happened to them. And in fact, they'll be even further infuriated because if you're quite right, they've been displaced from their homes yeah. and their regular activities, had to move elsewhere. And, and let's, not talk, let's not forget about the very real casualties mm. that Palestinians living in Gaza, whether they wore a uniform or not, have had to suffer as well. This is a key issue that has radicalised much of the current sentiment of those who are living mm. in Gaza. You kill mother, father, brother, cousin, because, mm. you know, you're in the IDF and really for you as a proud Israeli nationalist, Palestinians really don't exist. They're just things on a board, a chessboard, you know, that can be knocked over, that can be removed, but you don't have any vested interest in caring for your enemy or the enemy population. You just see them as a block of hostile actors. There are no prisoners of war, I gather. There are no prison camps. Usually, the, the oh, there, consequence. There, 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 are, there are detainees, and I want to actually uh, raise something that I saw yesterday, which I found extremely disturbing. You know, the way that the Western media actually reports the war is, as Liz rightly pointed out. I mean, we look at things from a particularly Western perspective, and we rope Israel into that camp. We're quite proud of yeah. the fact that they're a Western democracy, and yet, because of the way that we look at the war, we take out or edit. Um, the narrative. Mm. You were talking about um, human shields, right? There have been footage which has been released on YouTube of Israeli soldiers using Hamas detainees, unarmed, stripped down to their underwear, as human shields as they went into areas where they thought Hamas fighters were still having their thing. So if this, mm. if, if the Hamas fighter in front of the Israeli soldier got hit, well, that saves an Israeli soldier's life. If that isn't what I would say a human shield is all about, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it cuts both ways. Literally here. and figuratively. But, but you know, the Western media don't want to give anything other than a positive account of what Netanyahu's doing. And so that bad news story, which eventually will trickle out, but oh, it's yes. already starting to come out from various sources. Eh. Can I can I move along to a couple of other things? Because sure. uh, there's a bit of territory to cover, as I said at the beginning. Mm. I heard this morning, I couldn't believe, you know, you, you, you and I were there at the beginning when all of the hand-wringing was going on about the submarines mm-hmm. and there was the French and the, we, yep. we, we, I remember that uh, at the convention centre, I Correct. think it was, and yes. there, was, uh, there were representatives of the uh, 
Jap- of Japanese industry and the Japanese Navy mm-hmm. and uh, France and uh, I don't know if... Uh, Germany. S- Germany, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, searching, I mean, it was the most uh, uh, forensic examination mm-hmm. of the possibilities and opportunities there. Correct. And when we came up with the French mm-hmm. alternative, how, uh, how much did it cost us to get out of that? Oh, God. Um, I know it was... A high number. I'm. It was hundreds of millions of dollars. It was hundreds of millions of dollars. Just how much exactly? I can't tell you off the top of my head. But it was. It was a. a, a, a you would say it was a controversial figure uh, yeah, for most yeah, Australian yeah, yeah, yeah. taxpayers. And right? now I hear this morning yeah. that they are seriously considering scrapping the the, the current deal with the Americans. Mm. Where did that come from? Uh, that I don't know anything about, Jeremy. I'm going to have to pick up the paper and find out. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they, they, they are saying that the, uh, ideal solution would be that we will oh, share oh, American oh, boats. The Americans will have their, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Virginia class submarines. We won't buy them. Yeah. No, 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 no. We will, uh, have, uh, $365 billion to play with. Yeah. Like they can walk out of this August contract without any damage. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> 830 so million just under a billion dollars to get to... out of the contract with the French yep. so what is it going to cost us to get out of this one with the United States I think we'll have to sell our soul for the United States uh, for, for a graceful exit <laughs> they, will, they will extract the last pound of flesh from us but why would we do it what? Uh, he, no, look, look, Trump <laughs> will not support this because American shipbuilding is going through a reforming process and, of course, jobs in America are just as important for Americans as jobs for Australians are for Australian governments. So I would imagine that a Trump administration, American first, they will say, look, you know, um, yep, it's nice that you get nuclear-powered submarines from, you know, United States shipyards. They're going to be built over here so we can have jobs over here. The thing that you have to understand is that with the American system, it's very much predicated on a similar kind of structure here it's all about pork, finding the pork barreling effect in various state constituencies where you can mm. get the most mm. votes from. You go after those votes with a lucrative defense contract and say, hey, we've got defense jobs over here. That has got nothing to do with the strategic importance of buying a piece of kit, mm. but it's got everything to do with the economy and the perception of economic strength. Hello. Hello, Jeremy. Yes. Good morning. John, we're talking submarines. What would you like to talk about? I I, I know you don't have a computer, so you can't hear the program. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. Who's who's with you, Les? Uh, I'm I'm Les is with me, and Dr. John Bruni is with me. Okay. Good morning, Dr. John Bruni. Good morning, Les. Good Good morning, morning. John. Good to to hear your voice. (laughs) Yeah. um, A couple of things that sort of crossed my plate uh, this week. Uh, Firstly, the ALP having all their uh, cabinet ministers, I'm talking the state here, and and having five members from the uh, federal parliament as well, um, inviting those who have liberal businesses to come to have a... uh, a one-on-one chat or get involved in content, $500 a plate. It's uh, not a bad sort of racket, is it? Who have they invited again? They've invited those people who um, own businesses but are liberal-orientated. So they were the Labor government wants liberal supporters to come to dinner? Yeah. I'll be very careful about that. <laughs> 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 that's that's one issue, and then the Liberal Party can't get themselves together. I think uh, the issue with uh, Michelle Lemzik here the other night, I reckon that was an absolute disgrace. Absolutely. Well, well, I still don't understand what the debate is about. People have been debating this the the, the business of abortion for, for forever. Why do well, the, the sensible thing is to say it's nothing to do with politicians. It's nothing to do with men. Mm. It's to do with a woman and her doctor. What do you guys think? Yeah. No. A woman and a doctor. I, I believe that that is certainly an intrinsic right for for women. I mean, it's after all their bodies and their future and the future of whatever they want to bring to, to term. I mean, you know, in the end, who are we to tell people what to do? The only thing that uh, I, I'm a little bit hesitant about is where are the medicos in all of this? You know, in the end, they're the ones that have to do the job and, and they must have a say in this and a very strong say 
in order to ensure that people understand exactly what is at stake in terms of, God, I hate to use this, the, the, the termination versus the time, uh, the, the child or the, or the embryo the, or whatever. How mature the child how is. How mature yeah. the child is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and, um, um, yeah, go on. And the welfare of the, of the lady concerned. Indeed, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, there, yeah. Are a lot of, there are a lot of um, extenuating circumstances here which always fills this area with controversy. But I think I would rather have informed medical opinion weigh in heavily on this issue because I think that if you just hand this issue of controversy over to people who either believe in the right of abortion or not, yeah, yeah. you're just you're pulling but, the country but, apart. But the thing about it, to me, would have to be if, if, the, if the baby is almost to term, mm. almost full term, uh, that's not abortion, that's murder. Yeah, yeah look, yeah. Uh, my, my view on this is, uh, again, I'll say for what's worth um, telling people what they should do has been exemplified through the COVID period. We forced people to have a, an experimental vaccine, which is now causing many, many people severe health problems. So there's an issue that government got involved into a medical matter and the medicos were overruled, essentially. A lot of prominent medicos were overruled and still being overruled. Um, but the argument about uh, abortion has been hijacked by the <coughs> uh, comment that uh, the woman's body, yeah, my body, my body, my choice. Well, no, that's not the way the fundamental should be looked at. If if the woman is not pregnant, yes, my body, my choice. I agree with that one hundred percent. But once the woman conceives and the embryo is viable and becomes human life, and this is where I agree with John, the question of when a human life is a viable uh, entity. Um, I'm a pro-life person. I think that the moment <clears throat> there is viable life, whether it's in vitro or outside, whatever, um, I think there is a, a lawful position to take about whether or not that life should be preserved. And the argument, I think, in this legislation, the problem is that there, there would never have been a problem in the sense that if a woman came to full term and it was a medical question of whose life do you preserve, because if you deliver the child, there might be risk to the mother <clears throat> or vice versa. <clears throat> that often distills to someone incumbent making that choice saying, well, I'll sacrifice my life for the life of the child or no, I don't want to sacrifice my life. And the doctors then take the appropriate course of action. But I think when, when you have a situation where there is viable life, <clears throat> I think the law has an obligation to society to preserve life. Mm -hmm. and, and anything other than that it could be considered murder. Well, and I, I don't want to use that term, you know, too strongly, yeah. um, but if you take someone's life, what else is it except murdering that person? Well, you know, to, to, at the risk of sounding a bit graphic about this, and again, this is where I think the importance of having medical opinions step forward on this matter, late-term abortions, you know, you're, you're not just euthanizing um uh, the embryo or whatever you consider uh, is in there, uh, whatever term you want, you have to dismember it. Now, if you're a medico and you have to do that on a regular basis for late term, um, oh gosh, I, I'm just out of out of adjectives to use here, but a late term mm, uh, no, I get pregnancy, you drift, right? John, I get you. Drift. You know, I mean that that's going to have an effect on the medico's uh, psychology. So you're going to have uh, PTSD sweeping through some of the uh, best uh, surgeons in Adelaide. We, we are actually um, uh, not as advanced in this matter as the United States is, and yeah. the, some jurisdictions in the United States will allow those uh, abort. Well, it's not even abortion; the child is delivered. So it's a viable human being and put into a situation where they're made comfortable and allowed to die. That is as graphic as it happens. And that's, as I yeah. said, this is happening in the United States as we speak. Legally. Well, that's not acceptable. Well, that's almost, well, it's I can't probably imagine like any... exactly what's going to happen here in, yeah, in, in our jurisdiction. Yeah. And I think that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, John. And, and, just, and just changing the, the subject for the last, it was good to see that the Liberals nominated a new member for Unley, 
and she was unopposed. And that was, um, I can't think of the lady's name, but, uh, yeah, that's my little bag for this morning. So. Glad, glad you called, John. No worries. Enjoy the rest of your show. Okay. And thank you for your input. Okay. You take it Cheers, easy. John. Lo- no worries. Hi. Love to Pat, will you? Yeah, I say I'll give do. Him, give her my best. Thank you. You can give us a ring if you'd like to, 0491 65 68 60. Dr. John Bruni is with me. Uh, Les Elicus is here. Tony Denton is here as well. Uh, I don't know that you can sort of sum up the uh, Abrams tanks deal, but uh, did it surprise you? No, not really. I mean, we want to modernise our tank fleet anyway, and these tanks aren't particularly old, which is sort of strange in a way because... Why are we getting rid of them? We could have modernised them ourselves. But having made that decision, I'm a yeah. supporter of Ukraine and its struggle against Russia, so I think it's a good thing. Um, will they make a difference? Uh, well, there are 49 of them. Um, in the scheme of things, they will help the Ukrainian army sustain operations on the ground, but it's just not enough. And, of course, the Ukrainians need far more in terms of long-range weaponry to come to grips with Russia's overwhelming uh, manpower advantage. And now that... You know, latest uh, latest uh, intelligence reports seem to indicate that the North Koreans are entering the fray, and uh, Zelensky himself, uh, the Ukrainian president, said that we're looking at up to about ten thousand North Korean soldiers. You know, that just means more meat waves being thrown at Ukrainian mm-hmm. cities, um, and this is how Russia is fighting its war at the moment. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that North Korea hasn't fought a war since nineteen fifty three. They don't know what the back end of a high mass strike is going to be like. And I'm curious to see just how loyal these guys are going to be um, once they start getting hit by modern weapons. And, and this is um, the escalation that we're seeing in the Middle East too with other you know, entities entering the fray. And just to be pragmatic, the Abrahams tank deal is $245 million worth of taxpayers' funds and that, that takes the tally to $1.5 billion of taxpayers' money. In support, moral support. (laughs) Dr. John Bruni from Sage International.